So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who's Ernesto Alfaro Moreno, who is uh, uh, a pharmaceutical chemist and studied in both uh, UNAM in Mexico City and in Belgium on biochemistry and biomedical sciences. And he focuses on the toxicology of urban particulate pollutants, uh, interested in evaluating local and systemic effects induced by PM10, PM2.5 and nanoparticles. And he's the lead project lead on the EU Horizon Project Learn, uh, which he's going to talk a bit about today. He's been focusing on looking at the toxicity of particles, looking at their effects on cells and characterizing their inflammatory effects. I won't say much more than that, but to hand over to him so that he can then give his presentation. So it's over to you, Ernesto. And I'm going to talk about particulate matter, particulate matter in the air. What do we have to learn at schools? Thank you very much. So over to you, Ernesto. Would you like to share your screen? Yes, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for um, uh, attending this uh, talk. I will try to... Uh, to give um, a presentation that is uh, appealing to all of you. And uh, basically, um, as, as Paul was saying, I, I am a pharmaceutical chemist and I have been working my entire career as um, an evaluator of uh, the mechanisms of action of European particulate matter and, and different kinds of particles from soil and nowadays in the last uh 15 years i have been also working with nanomaterials and uh, since 2020 i have been uh, devoted mainly to to nanomaterials uh, but a um, uh, couple of years ago we were approached by a group of uh, people from uh, belgium and the netherlands and greece uh, saying that they want to work um, in a call uh, about indoor air and uh, health and uh, remediation. And then uh, due to my my past, I decided that uh, the, the best uh, option was to to work uh, at schools with with cohorts of children. So we did apply for for this project that we call learn. And uh, and I will uh, show you a little bit of uh, where uh, where the, the the project wants to go. It's a project that is still in the early stage. Um, uh, we have been we launched the project a year and a half ago, so we have not so many uh, actual results from the from the work at the at the schools and from the cohorts. But uh, we have done interesting stuff. So, so I will tell you a little bit about this. So, uh, first of all, I, I am very interested in, in air pollution because I am uh, Mexican. I, I come from Mexico City, where I, uh, where I grew up and where I did all my uh, studies. And, um, and this was the image of uh, Mexico City air during the 1990s. And of course, I don't have to tell uh, too much about air pollution to people from the UK, because all the all the field of uh, air pollution and health basically uh, started in 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 England after the Great Smog uh, in London in, in the 1950s. But you can see that things are still very bad in places like Shanghai or New Delhi. Uh, so, so this is a, a an ongoing problem. A few years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Lilian Calderon Garci Dueñas, uh, found that uh, uh, it's possible to to observe uh, nanoparticles or uh, extremely small particles uh, in the brain of uh, of different uh, uh, species. Uh, the first work she did was in. Uh, on stray dogs and uh, and nobody was believing her uh, but then when when she moved to analyze uh, uh, samples from uh, people dying uh, in Mexico City and in other regions uh, they were able to find these particles in the brain that were basically a uh, core of carbon and, and in many cases also uh, with uh, with some other components like iron and so on so 
it has been a, a while that since we learned that uh, urban air pollution and indoor air pollution can create health issues. Uh, originally, we were we were very concerned about uh, cardiac uh, arrest and uh, cardiovascular issues uh, due to the nature of the particles and to, due to the nature of exposure. But nowadays, the attention, especially in developed countries, uh, is turning to the side of uh, brain damage and, and things that could be related to the uh, uh, neurodegeneration and neurodevelopment. So that's why we choose to work with children, but also on top of that, to evaluate uh, outcomes related to uh, cognition, to issues related to, to cognition and to uh, issues related to development. So the LEARN project, uh, as, as, you can, uh, as you can read here, uh, it's uh, the overall goal of LEARN is uh, to develop uh, and deploy uh, novel sensors to detect uh, the presence of harmful air pollutants. Basically, we we try to measure the presence of uh, particles under one micrometer uh, using uh, sensors, and also uh, the presence of some uh, VOCs. And especially in my lab, what we are uh, very much interested in to do is to uh, using advanced in vitro models using long and skin on a chip uh, coupled to some kind of sensing in order to do uh, high throughput and real-time uh, results related to this, but also uh, using a non-mammal animal model uh, to, to evaluate uh, uh, neuronal effects. And actually a, a big chunk of the talk will be on, on this. So LEARN is, uh, as, as any uh, European project, is a multinational project. And we are basically the leaders here at INL. Uh, we are uh, working very closely to the Kai Leuven at the University of, of Hasselt in, in Belgium, uh, IMEC uh, Netherlands, but also uh, Eindhoven University, uh, Arros University, and Man and Hummel, which is a, a company that uh, develops uh, filtration systems. Uh, we have partners in Greece uh, and in Spain and in Switzerland. So it's a very interesting project and it goes uh, a little bit like this. We have in the core of the project, the, the heart of the project is basically uh, to have a cohort of, uh, of children from different schools. And we choose to do this in three different countries in order to have a contrast uh, based on the um, Cultural background of the of the societies, but also the economical status of the of the country. So so we have cohorts in uh, in Denmark, uh, close to Copenhagen, in uh, Belgium, close to Hasselt, and and also Brussels region, and in uh, Greece near to Athens. So. Based on this, we will do a characterization of air pollution, uh, both inside and outside of the schools, and we will measure biomarkers in the cohorts. Uh, we will do a, a remediation, and we, with all the results, we try to have an impact on the policy making and decision taking. And also, uh, uh, on the on the side of of uh, the development of new technology. We have the, the development of sensors for ultrafine and VOCs and the uh, in vitro assessment of the uh, particles and pollutants we can recover from the air. So this is a little bit uh, um, redundant, so I will skip that. So maybe this is a, a very interesting uh, image for you to see how we want to do this. So basically uh, we have cohorts of children that will come to the school and these children will be uh, monitored uh, by taking uh, blood and urine samples when possible. And also we will do some, uh, uh, some cognition tests on these kids. And we will uh, measure the air quality uh, inside and outside of the, of the school. And then we will proceed to have a, a remediation of the of the air pollutants by filtration systems developed by our uh, partners at um, Man and Hummel, 
but at the same time, we will develop new sensors to uh, have real time uh, and good uh, assessment of the air quality inside of the classroom. So the whole idea is that after doing the remediation, come back to the schools uh, and after uh, some, some uh, time and redo the assessment of biomarkers in the kids and also the cognition test. And uh, if things work uh, the way we think uh, they will, we will uh, we will have to see an improvement in in the markers in the childrens and also uh, an improvement in the cognition tests. Uh, at the end of the day, we would like to uh, couple the sensors with the remediation in order to have systems that, in real time, triggers the remediation. Uh, without having to wait for, for some uh, complex procedure to tell you have to do our mediation here. Meanwhile, uh, uh, here at INL, we are developing the multi-sensing systems for uh, in vitro evaluations, and we are using skin on the chip, lung on the chip, and C. elegans as an animal model. Uh, so basically, you can see here that uh, we will have uh, the cohorts that will go before and, up and after uh, the intervention of the remediation, and we will do different characterizations uh, in, uh, in the different parts of uh, our uh, consortium. So what is the study design? The, the, we will uh, work with children uh, from primary schools. So actually the cohort from Belgium is already set uh um, and we are working with children from uh, 9 to 12 years old we are in the process of recruiting the schools uh, from denmark and uh, and greece so the idea is during the next year we will we will do the the study in the three in the three countries uh, after we have the participation we will do their quality characterization the neurological test and uh, and the subjective indoor experience. Uh, from the side of uh, of the um, um, sensors, we are aiming to use uh, laser technology in order to be able to measure the presence of very uh, tiny particles in the air, in order to have a real time uh, response in this regard. And this is developed by our colleagues in. Uh, in Eindhoven University and uh, IMEC in the Netherlands. Here at INL, we are developing a uh, skin on a chip. So one, you, you know that the, the three main routes of exposure to air pollution is mainly by inhalation, but also skin exposure. So uh, here in, uh, in Braga, my associate Ana Ribeiro, she's developing uh, a skin on a chip uh, system with microfluidics uh, integrated. And basically we are uh, working with a, a, a dermis and an uh, epidermis. So we have uh, only epidermis and full thickness, uh, dermis and epidermis into the system in order to evaluate uh, particulate matter and other type of uh, pollutants like uh, some VOCs. And even we could do stuff related to uh, UV light and so on. But in this case, in the case of LEARN, we will be devoted to test uh, particulate matter. So the skin on a chip uh, started two years ago to the development, the basic development. So we went from the, uh, from the design of the chamber to do this. And now we have the cell culture quite well characterized and the microfluidics uh, quite well uh, standardized and we are ready to test uh, materials. We have run some um, basic tests using titanium dioxide and it works really well. So the idea uh, is to, to have this ready by the end of the year or the first quarter of uh, 2024 in order to do the tests of uh, the particles coming from LEARN. We also uh, are testing uh, by using long on a chip. Uh, this is a long on a chip developed by our colleagues in Switzerland. This is a company called Alveolix, and they developed 
uh, skin uh, long on a chip using a format that is pretty much uh, the same as a 96 well plate. And basically, uh, they have uh, a very good um, assessment by using uh, air liquid interface, which is very important uh, because this is the nature of, of, of our lungs. Our lungs are uh, air on the side of the lung and liquid on the side of the vascular uh, the vascularization of the lung. So they respect this thing. And also uh, they have a, a system that is connected to a pump and it creates breathing motion. So we have the, the integrity of the, of the alveolar and vascular uh, side, but also the motion, which uh, is neglected in most in vitro systems because it's not easy to have these kind of things, uh, especially if, if your life is not extremely rich. Uh, it is difficult to have this. So luckily for us, uh, Albiolix already developed this uh, system. And basically we will be able to use this, uh, this system to our samples. Uh, and we don't have to be extremely rich uh, as a lab, although the, the, the budget of the project is quite decent. Uh, to work with these uh, with these uh, things, uh, we will use some uh, cells uh, develop uh, that um, are exclusively from uh, from alveolics, uh, so they have the exclusivity of those cells. But we also try uh, will try to use other systems or other co cultures that we are developing in house. Bania Villas Boas is a, a other of my associates, and she's basically creating multiple cell cultures using uh, type 1, type 2, uh, sorry, type 1, type 2 endothelial cells and macrophages. And, and uh, she's quite advanced in this, in this multiple cell uh, system. It's working quite well. Uh, we have uh, decent per, uh, permeability uh, mimicking what you can find in, in primary uh, uh, assessments, and primary cells assessments and so on. So, so this is moving quite well. But then the novelty here is that we will introduce uh, a multiple sensing system that basically what we have is a, is a multiple sensor with antibodies related to different outcomes, uh, viability, inflammation, and uh, oxidative stress. And uh, the idea is to have um, these sensors giving the signals in real time in order to to see when we start to have uh, oxidative stress or inflammation or uh, decay in viability. Uh, the sensors I cannot show you the sensors sensors because this has uh, intellectual property issues, but I can tell you that we are in the phase of developing uh, the second the second stage of the development of uh, of the. Um, uh, prototypes. The first stage was creating the the setting of the of the um, uh, sensor, and now we are uh, in the stage of the characterizing the best strategy for functionalization, and uh, we aim to have this ready by uh, the second semester of 2024. Then it comes uh, what. I will spend a few slides talking about this. This is um, uh, the model that has uh, been under uh, use for many, many years. Uh, in in biology, it's quite well known, the, the model of C. elegans. C. elegans, for those who are not aware, it's a microscopic uh, worm, which uh, when it's mature in full length, it might be about one millimeter in, in length. Um, and it's quite uh, well characterized. We know exactly how many cells are in the in the worm, and we know exactly how many genes and how many uh, cells you can see in the gut, and how many neurons they have here and there. So, so it's a very very convenient uh, uh, animal model. It's a transparent uh, worm, so you don't. Uh, you can see things through uh, quite uh, quite easily, and because it's a worm, uh, there are not uh, uh, ethical concerns. At least uh, nobody have complained yet that we are 
working with this uh, with this animal model. So I will show you some results we have had uh, so far. So one thing, uh, because we we still don't don't have the the samples from from the schools, we decided to standardize the model using surrogate particles. So and in this case, we choose diesel particles. We know that what we will find in the in the schools is, is quite different from diesel. But we decided to go to, with something that we know is toxic, and that we know that there is some epidemiological data related to 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 it in order to have like a good positive control. And what uh, this is done by my associate Niverita Chatterjee, and what she have found so far is that, for instance, when when uh, the worms get exposed to diesel, you see uh, changes in the in the uh, uh, swimming behavior, the animals uh, tend to swim less when they get exposed to the higher concentrations of uh, of particles. So this is uh, very interesting because uh, right from the from the second dose of uh, of particles tested, we saw a decrease in in the mobility. This could be uh, due to toxicity or due to changes in behavior. Uh, I'm not showing to you the, the test of uh, toxicity, but we didn't see a decay in viability at these concentrations. So these concentrations are sublethal, but we have a change in the behavior. So, so we assume that this change is to some uh, effect uh, either on the uh, neuronal uh, system of the animal or some other effects that, that, that we are not aware of. But when we, uh, when we do some uh, assessment on the development of the animal, we can see that there is a decay in the, in the length of the animal uh, in relation to the to the concentration, so the the larger the concentration, the smaller the animal, and this goes very well uh, in concord in concordance with what we see in the in the life cycle of the animal. So here in gray you can see what is the size. Uh, or, or what is the stage of the of the C elegance after three days uh, of development? Uh, after one day, one day after the hatch, we expose the animal, and this is uh, so forty eight hours of exposure. So here, hundred percent or almost hundred percent of the animals are uh, in L four, which is this stage, and you can see that. Very few are uh, full, uh, fully grown animals, and very few are in, in in earlier stages. So almost all of them are in L4, and you can see here very nicely, very beautifully, that as we increase the concentration of particles of diesel, there is a delay in the mature in the maturation of these animals. So at the higher concentration, we have over 10% of the animals that the, the grow of, the, of these animals uh, is delayed. So this is quite interesting and it's a very important signal of uh, retardation in the development of the animal. Then you can see here that uh, at, at, uh, after day uh, four days, uh, in, in, in the case of the control, you have almost all the animals uh, fully grown. Maybe you can have less than 1% uh, as young adults or, or in L2, L3, but uh, L, uh, under L4, sorry. Uh, but uh, the same happens here. As you increase the concentration of particles, you see that uh, less amount of animals are in uh, totally uh, mature uh, form. And you, you see that the, the Previous stages are still present uh, in in comparison to the to the negative control, and you can see here some images. So so this is the the animal fully grown after four days, uh, after exposure to a small amount, you can barely see any different. Although you can see 
and here one animal that is quite small and as the concentration of particles increases you have more animals that are not fully grown as in the control now uh, when it comes to changes in behavior one of the one of the things that has been uh, told uh, by the people working on epidemiology and neuro uh, problems related to air pollution uh, people is telling that uh, one of the problems is mm, the appearance of uh, Alzheimer uh, disease uh, more frequently in highly polluted cities than in cities with low uh, pollution. And the mechanism is not well understood. And some people may argue that this could be due to too many factors uh, that are not necessarily related to air pollution, can be stress, can be diet, can be many other stuff. Uh, but in this case, when we when we test uh, our C elegans and we put the C elegans in presence of, of uh, diesel, uh, if the animal is not exposed, you can see here in the in the uh, in this region of the animal that it has certain amount of neurons that are uh, fully uh, uh, how to say it, normal. And when you have the the animal exposed to 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 the diesel, these uh, neurons get degraded, or you can you can barely see one that it looks normal, and the others look very uh, faint or very thin. And this is uh, consistent. And this these uh, neurons are the glutamatergic, though, so goes totally in line with what uh, epidemiologists observe in Alzheimer's because the glutamatergic uh, receptors, uh, it's uh, something that gets lost in, in Alzheimer's disease. So this uh, goes in concordance with that. And of course, because we, we are testing uh, our system and looking for alterations in development and in, in cognition, and uh, in this case, uh, neurodegeneration, this is extremely important when it comes to, to evaluate the potential effect we could have in children. Because of course, the earlier uh, we prevent the exposure to things that could have some neurodegeneration issues, the, the, the longer we postpone the potential appearance of, of uh, effects. Uh, I, uh, we are aware that it's almost impossible to eliminate completely the exposure to particulate matter. And maybe it's not uh, even uh, desirable to, to eliminate all the particles because we know that we need some, some kind of uh, challenge uh, in the environment in order to, to fully develop ourselves. But uh, if we can uh, prevent this kind of degeneration as soon as possible, it would be the best. And finally, we are doing some assessments using in silico uh, systems in order to be able to identify what are the, the uh, interactions between the components we identify in the particles and in the air, uh, the potential relation to different uh, neuroreceptors in order to have a better uh, approach when, when it comes to remediation and, and uh, enhancing our policies in relation to air quality. And just to finish, uh, I will show to you a couple of uh, results from uh, studies we did previously uh, in relation to, to air pollution, particulate matter, and things that we are not sure that uh, we will see some effect in the, in the population in the future, but there are good indicators that we should uh, be very careful. And the first one is related to a study done by my then PhD student Raúl Omar Quintana Belmares, uh, he was testing the presence of uh, different kind of pollutants in in, in um, PM10 and PM2.5 from Mexico City, and uh, out of some talks with uh, an, another uh, colleague Annette Kreis, uh, when I was living in Sweden, uh, I asked to her if she considered that we could find some kind of phthalates, some kind of 
endocrine disruptors in air pollution. And, and she was doubting about this, but she said, let's give it a try. So she tested these uh, phthalates that I don't remember the name of either because they have horrible names, but uh, you can you can find the, the publication and take a look at this. So we found some of the, of the, uh, uh, of the phthalates uh, present in PM10 and PM2.5. And when we did a correlation between uh, the composition and, and the fraction, we found that most of the uh, phthalates were associated to PM2.5 with a quite strong uh, uh, correlation of 0.7 in comparison to, to the correlation with PM10, which was below 0.2. So, so these particles were collected in the top of the building that serves as a, a high school in the city center of Mexico City. So on top of being exposed to harmful uh, carbon derived particles, VOCs and so on, these kids in their uh, early teenaging, the, these kids are between 12 and 15 years old, uh, get exposed to phthalates by, the, by these by these um, particles, and phthalates have a, has an impact on reproduction. So, in particular, uh, DHP uh, is known to uh, have an impact on sperm quality and secondary sexual uh, development of uh, boys. And then, just this year, we published uh, another. Uh, another uh, essay with the, our friend from uh, Sweden, Paulina Damdimopoulou. Uh, she's an expert in, in female fertility. And with our friend from um, uh, Hassel University, Tim Narod, uh, we look for the presence of uh, carbon particles in uh, ovaries and uh, I was uh, pushing Paulina for, for some time. I was telling to her, we should look if there are particles in the ovaries or in the uh, fluids related to, uh, to the maturation of the ov ovulum um, of your samples. And she was always doubting. She was always saying, no, that, that will be very difficult to prove. But now we, we match this technology of uh, uh, measuring the presence of uh, uh, black carbon uh, with femtosecond uh, microscopy. And uh, we were able to identify the presence of uh, particles both in the uh, in the ovarium and also in the fluids collected. And uh, we are we have no clue if this is related to uh, decreases in fertility, but we would not be, uh, surprised about that because we know that there are uh, endocrine disruptors in the particles. We know that there are um, toxic compounds in the particles. So the, these are things that that we have to keep in mind um, very clearly in order to uh, to provide a better future for our society. And indeed, if our children get exposed to these complex mixtures that has nanoparticles particulate matter of diff from different sources, uh, compounds that are endocrine disruptors, compounds that could be neurotoxic, and so on. We have to have a very good characterization of these things in order to clean the air uh, where our children are uh, spending one third of their lives when they are uh, at school and, uh, and try to provide a better uh, atmosphere for them. And uh, with this, I just want to uh, acknowledge the work of my team. This is my, my team at INL. Uh, basically, Nivedita is doing the C. elegans stuff. Uh, Anna is doing the um, skin on a chip, Bania the lung on a chip, and Michelle is doing the informatics, and Philippa is basically doing the uh, assessment of uh, inflammatory factors. I uh, also want to, to thank the food quality group and the water quality group at INL and uh, my colleagues from Hasselt University and Karolinski Institute.
So with that, I would like to thank you for having me and to invite you to visit us in Braga, uh, in the north of Portugal. In 2021, we were named as the best uh, destination in Europe. And it's a fantastic place, lovely, uh, with nice food and very, very nice people. Anyway, questions? Thank you very much, Ernesto, uh, for a fascinating talk. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Yes, I do. Um, so from Rongming, uh, she says, uh, how can, so she said, she missed, she came in late. How how can this, sen how this sensor can be used by children for the lung and the skin? I don't quite know what you mean, Rongming. Would you like to speak? Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Hi, um, Hi. I, I'm not from your uh, research area, but uh, I um, cannot fully understand. I understand that you are developing the sensors or something, and uh, you, I missed some slides probably. So how can these slides, uh, how can these sensors be applied or used by children? Well, the children, the, the children will not use the, the sensor. The, the, the sensor uh, aims to be coupled to, to a filtration system. So we are developing a sensor that will be hanging in the classroom. Uh, and these will give us signals of how much particles are in the air and, uh, okay. and the presence of some uh, uh, volatile organic compounds. And then... With this, we, we once we we um, find the the the, the right uh, tuning of the sensors, we aim to couple this to the filtration system in order that the filtration system gets activated automatically when we start to 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 arise the concentration of things that could be harmful. In order not to wait for the teacher to take a decision. In order not to wait for for some kid to say that oh, smells funny, you know. So this is the idea. Okay, because I saw the slides says uh, skin and the lung, so I I may yeah. miss. Yes, the, the, the I may have a misunderstanding. No, no, no. The, 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 well, ah, uh, I see where your 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 confusion comes. <laughs> my question, is, yeah. No, this is maybe due to due to my poor uh, uh, kind of explanation. No, uh, the the sensors in the air are to trigger the um, the remediation. These sensors that I'm talking about here are not aimed to be used in the field. These are okay. sensors that we are developing in order to do in vitro assessment. But the problem with in vitro assessments is that usually you measure an endpoint. You measure something after five hours or after 20 hours or after 72 hours. And many times it's very difficult to know what happened uh, during the course of that time. And in many cases, uh, you need different times for different endpoints. And then you have to do to make many assumptions in order to integrate this data. And in this case, what we are doing here is we are creating this multi-sensing device in order to collect the main uh, outcomes related to toxicity or uh, toxicity in a real time uh, and continuous uh, mode in order to have a very good uh, overview of how things are happening. But this is not intended to be used on uh, on the field. All right, thank you very much. Sorry, I have another quick question about the animal uh, animal experiment. Yeah. You have an animal used that, uh, what's the name of that? It's the elegance. The elegance. So, because I'm not from this area. So, um, from, you know, um, sometimes people use the uh, mouse or mice to do yeah. the uh, animal um, experiment and then sometimes some uh, scientists argue that how can you convince this um, is relevant to human or relevant to children so how are you answer that question thank you i have a very good answer for your question and and and, and uh, the thing is that we are looking to a neuron that has uh, a receptor 
that is highly preserved between humans and sea elegance. It's, it's uh, about eight percent of, of uh, ide uh, identity between the two the two receptors. So we cannot tell that what we see on the on the sea elegance can be translated to humans. No, we can't. But it gives a strong argument, considering that there are uh, already. Um, um, observations, epidemiological observations that people living in highly polluted uh, places with lots of particles and you can find the particles in the brain that there is an increase in the risk of Alzheimer, we can tell that this is a potential uh, mechanism of action by altering the uh, glutamatergic uh, receptors or the glutamatergic responses uh, in neurons. We cannot do the no, we can't. The, 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 any animal model will have this Thank issue. You. But the, the 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 good point of the C elegance is that the life cycle is extremely short, not months as in as in as in mice. It's it's a matter of weeks. And there are not ethical concerns. Nobody has complained yet to me that that, that uh, I am using worms. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, maybe I will contact you later regarding something very similar because we have some data for the uh, mice experiment. Uh, one Any, of the students. Anytime. anytime. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. So, Henry, you have a hand raised. Henry, you have a hand raised? No? The hands is raised, but maybe it's mute. Yeah, maybe you're muted. You are muted. No, don't know. We have another another question in the chat. Uh, it says uh, from Changuo, uh, so he thanks you for your great talk, which I agree. I am wondering whether this project could explore more on the cognition, such as the mechanisms, how the exposure to the lung or skin could be linked to cognitive decline. Well. Uh, it's not the aim of the study to 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 disclose the the mechanism of how this happens. We know uh, for experience that uh, uh, when there is an accumulation of uh, CO two in a in 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 a room, the the people in that room will have some issues with their attention because of course they they will start to not feel so well and they then you ventilate and 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 the basically the attention of the people increases because you take out the co2 so we are not uh, really into into that part of the of the characterization at this stage the 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 project aims to evaluate air quality impact uh, using some uh, uh, endpoints and in the lab we will try to understand why these endpoints are, are observed um, how the inhalation of particles under one micrometer may end into the brain that goes beyond the scope of the study and there, there are very good studies in relation to this, uh, even since the early 2000s, when, when Abdurrahim Nemar did publish the first uh, uh, hardcore evidence that uh, inhaled particles were able to translocate from the lung into circulation. And later on, many other studies ha have demonstrated that these particles can reach the brain, the ovaries, the kidney or whatever. There is very good evidence of of, of uh, this happening. The mechanisms are still under debate because could be related to changes in the permeability of the lungs, could be related to uh, active or passive transport uh, transportation, but it goes beyond the scope of the, of this study. Thank you. Thanks. I have a question of my own, which is: <clears throat> you mentioned these uh, cohorts. How many children, roughly, are you? Um... Uh, planning to monitor how many classrooms? 300, 300 per per uh, per country. Three hundred in Denmark, three hundred in Belgium, three hundred in, uh, and in and in different school. I mean, in different kinds of schools, like urban and and uh, rural, or just 
Do you mm, no, that? in this case, in this case, all of the schools will be uh, urban. Uh, due to the nature of the of the study, we will require twice the amount of of kids if we want to compare uh, rural and and, and uh, urban. But we, I mean the. The approach was uh, choosing uh, three different countries uh, in order to have a contrast, because we know, for instance, that in Greece is much more uh, common to have um, uh, passive ventilation, while in Denmark you will have much more uh, the presence of air conditioning and, and this kind of thing. So, so that's why we we choose these uh, differences and also the the economical status of of the the three nations is different so so this will give us the 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 different patterns not not rural and 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 uh, okay. and urban okay fine so henry who had his hand raised said he thinks his zoom is bugged but he wanted to ask you uh, you're carrying out an indoor intervention but do you know if the expected impacts from indoor exposures are greater than those from outdoor exposures? <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, and that's why we will monitor uh, indoor and outdoor in order to, to have a contrast. For instance, uh, and I will speak from my personal experience as a Mexican. Uh, when, when, when I was at school in Mexico, basically you ventilate by opening the door. And if it is warm outside and there is uh, you know buses passing by the school you will have all the fumes coming in so so there will be no real gradient and even during the cold season uh, i mean the cold in mexico city can be uh, very mild for you uh but but you, you even if the windows are closed you 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 don't have sealed uh, buildings so we don't care about uh, keeping the temperature in the building. So, so there is lots of impact from the outdoor into the indoor. In places yeah. like Denmark, this is a complete different animal where, where you have a very clear difference between these two settings. So that's why we are going to monitor inside and outside. And the, 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 the gold part, the, the golden part of the, the entire study will be that if the remediation has an impact on the biomarkers and, 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 and the cognition test, then we can tell that the responsible of this shift will be due to uh, the intervention, because of course we will not filtrate the, the, the air of the city. Yeah. Okay, and, and Henry adds at the end that he thinks your study is very interesting and wants to know more. And okay. I don't know if you are aware of his role, but he, uh, he runs another project looking at air pollution in schools, focusing on measuring both CO2 and PM uh, 2.5. So I think he would um, uh, be very happy to connect with you and your project in the future. So any any time, I, I am I am not aware at this moment. I, I, sh I am very bad with names, so I should read the uh, carefully in order to to look at this. But uh, in general, I am very happy to to interact with anyone who would like to to speak with us excellent okay so i think uh, we should that's coming to an end there are no more questions in the chat uh, i uh, uh, cat has put in the information as usual about uh, where you can see our seminar series on our website and also if you'd like to join the network uh, or contact her directly um, so that information is in the chat this is the last uh, seminar in this series this year. And so I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, all of you for attending. Many of you have been very loyal uh, attendees uh, over the course of this uh, term and I appreciate that very much. And I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have. I'd like to also th obviously thank Ernesto for today. It was a very fascinating talk and we wish you all the best with your LEARN project, and we look forward to seeing the results as they come through in the next few years. So that's, you, that's it from me. Thanks, everyone, again. I hope uh, you have a good break, and we'll be back in touch with further activities from TAPAS uh, in the new year. So thank you all, and goodbye.